Welcome to this Day One Conversation. I'm Peter Wallace, and with us today is the Reverend Dr. James E. Lamkin, who is Senior Pastor of Northside Drive Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. James, thanks for talking with us. Thanks. It's an honor to be here. I really like your church's motto, inclusive, inquiring, involved. Yeah. How does that work at Northside Drive Baptist Church? Yeah. I think it both defines who we are and also at the same time defines who we want to keep becoming, hmm. uh, of welcoming all people, of investing our lives in community. Uh, like one of the parts of our vision statement is um, uh, doing mission work for our own growth as disciples while carrying out the work of Christ in the world, mm. uh, that, that the investment is not to fix other people, it's to keep working at ourselves. And as we do that, we give away ourselves. Um, so uh, it, I see it as a spiraling outward mm -hmm. that comes from the center of who we are. Give us a sense of the worship and the witness that the church aspires to. Uh, the worship, uh, I would, in the words we use, is uh, formal, liturgical, especially for Baptists. <laughs> uh, that may not fit. Uh, it may be liturgical light for other groups, for, but for Baptists, it appears to be high church. Uh, but we have found a strength in that liturgy that is like a, a, a constant flowing river, mm. and that you can always count on the liturgy to carry you along. Some days you feel like paddling, some days you feel like swimming, some days you want to sit on the bank, but you can trust that the river is there. Mm. And so that predictability is a part of the worship's power, both for me and uh, for the congregation. The witness and mission is uh, kind of grows out of that liturgy. Since we are a rarity, especially among Baptists, uh, not all Baptists fit our ilk of what we're up to, mm -hmm. but uh, people who who are of that that disposition and that theology of uh, this is how I want to approach how I express my love for God. When they find us, they go, well, this is home. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm so glad I've I've come home. And so that is its own mission enterprise just by being ourselves. But then we invest in the community and in the world in, in various venues and faces. Like with Habitat for Humanity, we go way back with the Atlanta chapter of Habitat. Mm -hmm. And so that's the hands-on uh, part. And I guess one other aspect that, that I and we are very proud of is an intergenerational aspect. Uh, that uh, the kids know the older adults by name and the senior adults see the little kids as children, as, as their grandchildren or great-grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's an intimacy uh, that I don't think uh, a lot of big steeple churches uh, um, either tolerate or, or facilitate. You're in your 14th year at the church, which yeah. is a relatively long time. Hard to believe. What sort of opportunities does that offer you and your church? Well, I think in, in a way the, the opportunities and liabilities may be, <laughs> may be one and the same in that um, there are no new tricks up my sleeve or theirs. Mm -hmm. That uh, if, if they're going to love me, it's going to be the me that they've come to know. And if I love them, it's going to be the, the them mm -hmm. rather than me trying to change them, you know. And, uh, and part of the gift of the long relationship is, is the trust of that. Um, uh, and that, that hasn't been an easy thing for me to do. Mm. It's been its own, own journey to trust that, that the self God has given me and that God and I have worked on is the self that they're asking mm. for and that God thinks they need. Um, I think of uh, a great quote from William Sloan Coffin, uh, who said, uh, we are called not to prove ourselves, but to express ourselves. Mm. And oh, what a difference there is between proving and expressing. And um, I think uh, the first several years, there's a lot of proving mm -hmm. for me going on. Maybe their side too. But I have enjoyed the opportunity to lean more in expression. And it's my sense that it's reciprocal. Maybe, maybe I learned it from them. I understand, too, that you have a notion about the pastor as chronicler of the congregation. 
What do you mean by that? Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about that lately, and I don't hear it mm-hmm. in seminaries or, or in writings. Um, but uh, I think of the pastor as one who pays attention to the story. And the story is a weaving of two stories. For the, It's the congregation's, and it's God's story. And I find myself... Um, in the articles I write and the pastoral prayers I pray and the sermons I try to preach, that somehow that blend of stories is there Mm -hmm. so that, say, it's an anniversary, church anniversary celebration, that I'm not just thanking the people that worked in the kitchen to make the meal or those who printed the orders of service or uh, sent out the invitations, but I remind them of what it's my job to pay attention to Mm that they're part of this big story. And when I hold up the picture of all the guys doing the groundbreaking 58 years ago, to note that uh, is, is it that they're trying to level ground to put a building on it, or are they planting something? Mm-hmm. And uh, if you didn't know the story of the building, you would think, well, they're just well-dressed farmers. <laughs> Uh, and maybe that's exactly what they are. And they're planting something that they didn't know they were putting in the ground. Mm. What do you think it is? Well, I think it was hope. Look around the room. Think about your family. Look at who's sitting beside you on the pew. That we are the fruit, the fruition of the hope, the seeds that they planted long ago. And for me, that's that's the, the meta story uh, that needs chronicling. Because on, from where I stand um, uh, as pastor of the congregation, it's a perspective that no one else is allowed the luxury of seeing. But when I see from that perspective, uh, I see how our small story fits into what I believe is God's big story. Hmm. James, you've long been an active part of Atlanta's interfaith community. In fact, you were the organizer of an interfaith pilgrimage of Muslims, Christians, and Jews to Turkey in 2002, and you led another interfaith pilgrimage earlier this year. First of all, why is that important for you personally to be engaged in interfaith efforts? Um, I, I think it, if it's not the essence of spirituality, it's the first cousin. Hmm. Uh, what I've learned in my journeys um, is an echo from what I learned in my Baptist Sunday school as a kid of uh, hospitality is an avenue of knowing God, Mm. and especially to the stranger, because as we are hospitable to the stranger, we also learn something about being gracious to the stranger within ourselves and the stranger called God. So um, I had been somewhat involved uh, before 9-11, 2001. I had one day the idea I needed to work on a friendship with an imam. Mm-hmm. And that is very outside. It's hard to remember pre-9-11, mm-hmm. but that was very outside the, the thinking then. Uh, but something said to me that my life could be enriched because of that, and my congregation's life could. And so I called up Jan Swanson, who's a very active uh, uh, matchmaker among the interfaith community. Mm-hmm. And I said, what imam might I get to know or Muslim? And she said, Pleman el of the Masjid of Al-Islam. And so he and I connected as friends and then connected with congregations, and then 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, what happened uh, in me then and why I think this is important is it's a way of of two things happening. One, it sends me deeper down my own well, my own Christian well, of where does the water come from? What's the deepest uh, water that's the most life-giving to me. And then as I go deeply down that well, uh, to use a, uh, a filer uh, illustration from his book, Abraham, Father Three Face, mm-hmm. the more deeply you go, then you tap the underground river that connects all faiths of where all the deep water comes from. And so as I work on my spirituality relationally with people of other faith, then it just helps deepen my own uh, sense of I'm in the right place and know the right people that enriches my life. Mm. It seems in this past year the differences between religions and their adherents have led to greater conflict 
in our society. For example, some months ago, the huge debate about the Islamic Cultural Center in Manhattan near Ground Zero. In this time of deeply divided political and religious views, what should people of faith be doing? Well, uh, I think two things. Um, one, they should uh, go deep into the well of their own mm-hmm. and get nourished spiritually because whatever is ahead of us, especially as we think of a new year ahead, whatever is ahead, it's probably not going to be easier mm-hmm. than where we've been. It's still going to be tough. And so you need to be well hydrated. Mm. That's a good mm-hmm. image. Well hydrated as you prepare for the for the, the conversation ahead. And then second, after having drunk from your own uh, place and nourishment, find a way to articulate that. Uh, now, people may see it differently than I, but uh, I, I think uh, hospitality um, uh, and acceptance and inclusivity has, is the way of Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, sometimes in an interfaith setting, we talk about what's what's different among us, and somewhat tum- tongue in cheek, but uh, but with a lot of delight, I say, well, I'm with the outfit uh, whose founder said, "Love your enemies." And then mm-hmm. I say, well, we don't, we hadn't always done that, and I don't do a good job of it, but but that's the outfit that mm-hmm. I'm with, and so uh, f- find find the connecting point and speak to that. Now, your spouse is also a minister, the Reverend Liz Harris Lampkin. Tell us about your family. Well, it's a great family. Uh, (laughs) uh, Yeah, I always wanted to marry a preacher. (laughs) Uh, Liz is uh, one of the staff chaplains at Piedmont Hospital here in Atlanta. But also for about 16 years now, she has been a chaplain with the Air National Guard first in Virginia, and then here in uh, Georgia. And she is a chaplain, a lieutenant colonel mm-hmm. of the Air National Guard in uh, Georgia. And since we're both Baptists, uh, a little liberal kind of left-wing Baptist, but both <laughs> Baptist, we have this thing about First Amendment rights. And it is uh, a, a really important uh, evangelistic message for her to name the respect that we must have for all faith groups. Mm-hmm. Sometimes in Georgia, we can get a little provincial, uh, but it's her job to, to, to say our boundaries have to be uh, wide uh, because that's our calling and faith. And so that's, that's uh, Liz. And uh, uh, I have two kids. Uh, my son, Stuart, is an editor uh, in Macon for Smith & Helwes Publisher. Uh, he and his wife, Sarah, are the parents of my grandson, uh, Sean, and, and I'm Papa. <laughs> to, to Sean. And then my daughter, Emily, uh, works for Tennessee Baptist Children's Home in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, that's our bunch. Wonderful. Yeah. And you are a juggler. That yeah. skill must be helpful in the parish ministry. <laughs> yeah, I, I got into juggling when I was going through a tough time in my life. I gone was going through a divorce and a uh, clown friend of mine said, you ought to take up juggling <laughs> uh, because you can just throw your cares away. Mm. And uh, it became a great metaphor mm-hmm. for me. Uh, first, of learning to juggle, you can only concentrate on that kind of you know, one thing only. Uh, but upon but upon focusing that, then there are multiple variations and, and ways of it. So uh, yeah, I, in the it's a pretty good metaphor for the pastorate because there's always stuff up in the air. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's always more going on than I feel adequate to be able to handle. Uh, But there's an art to it, too, that uh, I relish. Hmm. 